is Ethan Vesley Flad. I'm Director of National Organizing and Interim Co-Executive Director at the Fellowship of Reconciliation. I'm joining you today from Asheville, North Carolina, um, Cherokee land, where I'm delighted to welcome all of you into our live audience for a conversation with Eric Corson, who is the editor of the new book, Reaching Beyond Prison Walls. Um, and Eric, thank you so much for agreeing to uh, have this conversation with FOR and our friends today um, about this wonderful collection of stories from um, people who visited folks who are incarcerated and uh, some of the voices of those who've been incarcerated themselves. Um, and I just want to um, start today by just saying for everyone who doesn't know about FOR, um, a, a big bit of a background about us as we then uh, start talking about the background of prisoner visitation and support um, and learning about that legacy. The Fellowship of Reconciliation is the nation's oldest interfaith peace and justice organization um, founded in 1915. And our mission is to organize, train, and grow uh, a diverse movement uh, working for nonviolent social change. Um, we were founded at the very start of World War I um, to support the rights of uh, conscience and resistance to war and military conscription. And so I think that that history and that story of our uh, fellowship and both internationally, because it was founded in Europe at the very outbreak of, of the, the so-called Great War, um, um, and in this country a year later in 1915, is really a, a, an interesting sort of foundation and, and leading into um, the story of prisoner visitation and, and support. Um, um, and because my understanding, um, Eric, as we invite you to then talk about yourself and about PVS and about this book is maybe let's start with talking about PVS, which you served for 40 years as executive director, but you weren't there on that first day. Um, so maybe you could talk about what, what it was that brought PVS to being. What was the vision that, that created that and, and, and why was it started at the point that it was? Yeah, and uh, thanks for having me. And I've I've been affiliated uh, with FOR for many, many years and all the good work that FOR does. So I'm very pleased uh, uh, to be here. Um, uh, Bob Horton and Faye Honeynop were the co-founders of PVS. Um, and they individually were visiting uh, way before the organization was created. Uh, Bob Horton was uh, a... Um, Methodist minister in Rochester, New York, and uh, somebody in his congregation during World War II refused to go into the military and was incarcerated uh, in uh, a federal prison. And Bob, you know, who had not been in prison before, you know, he went and visited uh, his congregant and uh, the whole world opened to him of prison and so on. And eventually he began to visit other people, particularly prisoners of conscience, uh, and, um, and then continued to do that forever <laughs> until he passed away. And then a honey knop uh, about maybe 10 years later in the mid fifties, she began to visit people, particularly civil rights activists uh, and um, uh, she began to see people. She uh, visited even people who were perpetrators and who had done, who had committed acts against the civil rights people. She visited some of those folks too, uh, interestingly enough. Um, and so during the Vietnam War, at some point uh, they got requests as individuals, but they knew each other and they began to visit around the country. Uh, and this would have been in federal or military prisons because that's what the, uh, where you would be incarcerated. Uh, and it got to be bigger and bigger. And of course, as the Vietnam War protests and so on uh, continued, more and more people went to prison uh, and they continued to visit these folks and they would crisscross the country until at one point, they just simply said to themselves, we can't do this by ourselves. We're getting older and it's just really rough to go across the country. And so they got permission from the Federal Bureau of Prisons and then the Department of Defense 
to appoint local visitors uh, to a particular facility. Uh, and that's really how PVS really got going. Um, and um, I was a conscious objector. <laughs> Uh, and in 1971 to 73, um, I went out to Ohio uh, <laughs> and um, worked for the American Friends Service Committee. Uh, and I was doing peace work and uh, prison work. Um, <laughs> uh, the meeting had a draft counseling service and so at, at the Quaker meeting there. And so I would receive these phone calls from either parents or uh, spouses or sisters or brothers, or whomever saying, Hey, you know, uh, this relative of mine is locked up in the, in the local jail. Can somebody go and visit this person? And so I went to the, the um, Quaker meeting and said, Hey, I, somebody needs to see them. I'll do it just appoint me as a, as a visitor, as a um, clergy, actually. And so that was done, and I started to go and visit. <laughs> and the first time I went, I had no, I, no clue. I'd never been in jail or prison before. So I grabbed the Bible out of the uh, <laughs> meeting you know, to, with me to, as a way of just thinking, well, at least I've got that. If somebody questions me, you know, there's the Bible. I never had to open it at all. As soon as I started visiting with people, um, you know, things just went along and, and so on. And it was during that time when Faye Honey Knopp came to uh, Ohio. Um, she was working on her book, Instead of Prison, Handbook for Abolitionists. And I set her up to speak at a various places in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, and all sorts of people came out to hear her, incl including people from the corrections field. Uh, and um, eventually she told me about PVS and that there was an opening. And um, at that point, I decided to apply and so on. And so when I was there, they asked me for a two-year commitment. And I hesitated about that, but I guess I was okay because I did that for 40 years um, because I love all the visitors, you know, and, and several of you are here. I mean, they're just such amazing people who don't really think they're amazing, but I know that you are. Uh, and it was a real privilege to be working with the visitors and prisoners and their families and even, and prison officials as well who understood the program. Um, so that's really the, the beginnings of, of PVS. And then eventually, of course, as the war waned and then eventually was over, there were plenty of other prisoners, unfortunately, who were locked up. And the focus really began to be not just seeing any prisons, but those who really had needs, long-term prisoners, uh, prisoners who might have been in solitary um, uh, and... Um, uh, and that's that's where it grew to be. At one point, I, I think 400 visitors across the country. I believe it's more like 300 now because COVID really has <laughs> affected so many things, including prison. Well, for almost two years um, till recently, uh, there was no visiting. Uh, and of course, I wasn't uh, with PBS then, but I know that that was pretty hard to be a vis to say you're a visitor and yet you can't visit, you know. So um, anyway, that's that's really kind of the the history of of me and PVS, uh, and I, it was a wonderful experience with all the visitors. Yeah. And I just will say that the 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 reason for this book is that I knew that I when I was going to retire, I knew I was going to have a really hard time in dealing with that, missing all the wonderful visitors. Uh, and so I decided to do a farewell tour uh, and I didn't get to every state, um, but I got to a good number of them and I was interviewing people um, about their visiting and so on and decided to put that into a book. Uh, and uh, some of you are here who I didn't get to, uh, you know, were good enough to send me a write-up as well, and I really was grateful, like Sandy, for example, sent me her write-up. Um, and uh, 
that's where this book came to be. Thank you for the, the whole framing, um, the, the story of PVS and its founding. And, and I didn't, I don't think I even realized how long the legacy was going back to those uh, uh, kind of forties and fifties um, to the point that it became a, an official organization. And, and ultimately would you, let, let, let's stay there in the early years in the seventies, let's say in the period when you, uh, we're working, I think it was, you said it was with AFSC and working in Ohio, and then coming to learn about this work as you were counseling thousands, I think, of, of young people, mostly men, uh, young men uh, who are um, thinking about the, uh, mil the military and whether they were going to be pulled in. And PVS was at that point uh, work, already starting to work with um, uh, young men who were had been imprisoned for the resistance. Um, Talk a little bit more, if you would, about that period over the next few years as the war ends, as you've named it, in the mid-70s, um, and the shift, that, that, that decision to really start working with a broader population of people who are incarcerated. Um, can you speak, I know, I know that again, like you come into the, to being on the staff, I think around 1977. Yeah. Um, and so can you say a little bit about what that decision making was and the conversations that might have been happening among PVS leadership to really real how to make that shift because that's a big one, right? Um, yeah. Uh, well, it was it was a big one in one sense and not in another because what happened it, it was really the prisoners that that created the change really because and that was really kind of before I really got fully involved and so on, but. Uh, I I know what happened, and that uh, the the uh, visitors were seeing the conscience objectives, the prisoners of conscience, and they were getting some of them got visits. They certainly got mail and things like that, and they started encouraging the visitors to say, "Hey, you know, there's other people in this prison who are who aren't getting any mail, aren't getting any visits, in some cases are locked away and nobody even knows where they are almost. That's how deep they are in certain of the prisons and so on. And so the, the leadership, Bob and Honey, uh, you know, said, yeah, you know, let's do that. Uh, and they started to visit prisoners who were indeed locked away and so on. Uh, and, um, I won't say that was a complete focus, but it was definitely something that was very important uh, to visit prisoners who really, really had nobody. Whatever they may have done, you know, uh, uh, that's a whole different matter. But there they were. Uh, and so we went and, and, and did that. Um, and um, that became at least one of the foci of visiting those who are doing long sentences, who are in solitary, uh, who are in special units. And, um, and that was a focus, although not exclusive uh, to that. It was, but that was certainly, <laughs> you know, trying to meet the needs of people who had nobody else. It really does come through powerfully in the book. I mean, I, I, over and over again, and Again, let me stress for those of you who, who are new to the book, I realize there's several people here who are whose voices are in it or who have yeah. about it. But um, those of you for whom this um, you don't know about it yet, I mean, it's dozens of voices here, th thanks to your your outreach tour that you did and, and all that kind of thing. So many different perspectives, of mostly of um, people who spent um, lengthy periods of time visiting and a few, uh, as, as you've named, yep. of people who um, were incarcerated and um, and speak from that perspective of being in prison and, and have been visited. But over and over again, you hear uh, the person that this person I visited hadn't seen anyone for eight years. 10, 12, 15, I think, yeah. I think you said, and maybe in your introduction that you visited someone who hadn't seen another person from the outside in 30 years. 32 um, years. Yeah. yeah. That was, um, that was up in Allenwood, Allenwood, Pennsylvania penitentiary. And what's interesting about working with the system and so on uh, was that this person was referred by the warden and the chaplain there who knew I, who knew me and knew I was coming up to do a national visit and said, um, can you try and visit this guy? 
and that's where one of my things was working with the prison staff to be able to, to talk and dialogue and interact with them uh, so that they could trust us uh, to be able to say, look, you know, here's somebody, you know, yeah, he's locked up. We, you know, he did some pretty bad things on the outside, but he's here <laughs> and, and, no, and nothing's happening positively, you know, and I did visit with that person. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a lot of different uh, questions I want to ask here. And I, I just want to name every, to everyone here um, that we want to invite your voices too as a, later into the program. So we're, um, we're going to continue talking for another 15, 20 minutes, and then really would love to invite um, comments, questions, again, your voices into our time together. Um, but so I, I wonder if Eric, um, let's start uh, maybe one of the key pieces is just Again, for those who don't really know about PBS's work, and giving more of the con the context, um, talk about the framework of the purpose of the visits. Because I was talking with somebody about it yesterday, and they were like, "So it's not illegal." Uh, and I was like, "No, no, this isn't legal work. It's not a." And, and they're like, "It's not a. It's not a chaplain." I was like, "No, no, this is not a religious vision. It's really about listening uh, and humanizing." Would you? And even would you though it's it's interfaith, non denominational. In my way, it's very Quaker-like because it's unprogrammed. There's not, you're not coming in with any special purpose except to be there. And different visitors have their ways of interacting, of course, with the prisoners. Uh, but, you know, there's no agenda except to be there. Uh, and that's really important because quite a few prisoners uh, really, <laughs> you know, have been alienated so long. It may be for good reasons. They may have created some of that, but it doesn't matter. There they are locked up and um, they're pretty cynical. They think people are coming in to, with some sort of agenda. And the PVS visitor comes in without any agenda except to be there. Uh, and that's, that's unique, at least in my experience to just simply let the prisoner set the agenda for whatever he or she wants to talk about. Um, so that's, that's what's very unique, I think, about that. And that's where you will get prisoners who will share things they wouldn't dare share with anybody else. Uh, I had the experience one time uh, visiting a, a, a political prisoner, actually, who had... Um, uh, been assaulted by, uh, at, at least so she said to me, by a uh, corrections officer. And she had not told her husband that at all because she was afraid that if he found out, he would do something crazy. You know, I mean, he would just so be so angry. But she shared it with me. <laughs> and uh, for two hours, she was talking to me about this and sobbing because she trusted me. Uh, and um, that's unusual, but uh, it just shows you the need for, that people have when they're locked up and, and they, you know, when they finally find somebody uh, to trust them. I'll just share one other thing. When I was visiting in uh, Lexington, Kentucky, which at one point was uh, in the basement of the prison, was this high security um, uh, place for women. It was the most secure prison setting in the United States for women. And there was just like 10, maybe 10 women in there. Uh, and um, I was the first person from the outside allowed in to visit that unit. Uh, and it was because the head of the prison system uh, told the warden to let me in. Apparently, the, the prisoners told me that the warden wasn't going to let me in. But the head of the Bureau of Prisons uh, supposedly contacted the warden and said, you need to let him in. And I went in and saw them. Uh, and these were, you know, these were political prisoners, so they were very strong-willed people and so on. And they were being broken just by the whole aspect there. The lights were on 24 hours a day. Uh, the cameras were there so that whatever they you know, uh, it, it was just that setting and so on. And I spoke with 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 people there and there were tears in their eyes, you know, and I, I had to be very careful because all this time there was an officer sitting outside with a notebook and pen 
taking notes and so on. I, and, um, and the cameras and all that stuff. And as the women started to weep, I had to really, you know, be careful uh, because I didn't want them to just completely break down. But it's just this kind of tension that you can encounter uh, in a prison setting that we can cut through that sometimes um, because we're trusted, you know, we're trusted by the prisoners and, and we're trusted by the staff. And that's really unique because you don't find that very often. And so the kind of volunteers, the kind of visitors who do that are really, really unique people, you know, who are there for the prisoners, but who are not there to pick fights with the staff or anything like that either. You know, they're there. The bottom line is you visit prisoners. That's, that's why you're there. Um, and you don't get sidetracked by anything else. Would you speak a little more to, I mean, you've referenced in, in a couple times now the, the relationship with the prison staff and system. Uh, and obviously for you, particularly as the executive director who is working with visitors all around the country in dozens of carceral institutions, some you know, coordinator positions, but lots of just people who are doing it as the volunteers. Yeah. And, um, and so you're doing this with the visitors, but also many, many institutions and the, and the Federal uh, Bureau of Prisons overall. Um, and the Department speak, of Defense. And the, right, uh, um, and I, I wanna get to that later, but um, just, just in terms of those systemic relationships, a number of the people in their reflections, you know, again, some of which are very short, just a couple of paragraphs, some of which are two or three pages. Okay. You know, um, a number of them really speak to the dehumanization that they that they not only witnessed but in, in some ways really experienced as well directly. So, you know, not many and not, not everyone, but some of them spoke very specific ways in their writings uh, about what was so difficult about in, um, going through a system that is often arbitrary and capricious. Um, you know, spiteful, and uh, you would say um, uh, there's you know new rules and uh, rules and regulations that maybe they don't haven't been given or things like that. Um, and then there's just so many different things that are constricting their ability as coming from the outside, much less that for the, the, the prisoners. And I mean, like, I remember one of the examples that, that struck me of uh, was one of the people reflecting on the, the waiting room space that they would go into in that, in that prison was always, they said, really quite cold very cold and you couldn't wear your coat in there um and it and it's um you know just bare and and so forth and how and the the relationship they had others spoke to good relationships with staff but there were a number of people who wrote to that so could you talk more about the process of work of needing to hold those relationships in respectfully and and, and integrally well i mean the bottom line is that the prison systems of bureaucracy you know, uh, and so uh, the bureaucracy, you know, you, you have it, it, people aren't necessarily free to just do whatever they want to do. Uh, there are rules and so on, uh, especially in the federal prison system. Um, and um, I one of my one of my roles was really to relate to the wardens, of course, uh, so that when there were problems, you know, we could try. Uh, to straighten things out so that um, there were 122 and there might still, I think there still are 122 federal prisons plus a number of military prisons. And I, my thing was to, to know every single warden in the country, the federal wardens, um, so that if there was something that was a concern, I could pick up the phone and call the person and be able to talk with them. And uh, they never turned down my calls. Um, and that was really important to me to be able to relate to them. Um, one of the things that I was allowed to do, unlike anybody else, uh, <laughs> uh, was in the federal prison system. They had a warden's conference, which used to be every year. And now I have no idea what it's like now, but it eventually, I think it maybe became every two years or whatever because of budget problems. But at one point it was every year. And I was allowed to go to the warden conferences there 
uh, and meet all the wardens. I was the only outside person allowed there. Uh, so there was little old me and the rest were wardens and other staff from the Bureau of Prisons uh, there and maybe a few people from the Department of Justice uh, who were there who were speakers or something like that. And I got to interact with all the wardens so that they saw that PVS was a legitimate uh, program and that they needed to respect uh, this program and not only respect it, but encourage it. Um, and that's why in the, uh, in the beginning of the book, I asked one of the former wardens who used to be the warden at Lompoc, California to write a prologue to the book uh, because I got to know him and I still know him. He and I still talk with each other uh, uh, once in a while. Um, and it was, and it was just really important to be able to, to re interact with the people who were basically controlling the, the system and so on. As far as individual staff, it varied. I mean, there, there are some really fine staff and some other staff who weren't <laughs> so fine. Uh, and, um, I think my hat's off to the visitors who really had to deal with, particularly staff who weren't so fine or weren't so nice. And, and, and you know, you want to be persistent. You want to be strong. You want to be let in and not turned away, uh, you know, and yet you want to be able to somehow or other not turn off the staff to get angry with you, you know. And so I, I, my hat's off to the visitors who every month, you know, had to deal with this. And it's not easy. It's in fact, it's really rough because some of the staff were really, you know, uh, very difficult. Uh, yeah, clearly. I mean, uh, mixed. And, and but I think, I mean, uh, that the intro that the warden, the former warden of Lompoc um, writes, does really speak to it. And I, I know that there's a couple other examples in the book where it speaks to um, the relationships that partly you held, but also that were impacted. I think that one of your core trainers or volunteers, maybe maybe also in California, I can't remember, um, writes about um, a warden who, who had been an assistant warden, actually, uh, or whatever the title was exactly, and had been more, more open to the work um, and then invited this person to come in and do, uh, maybe it was you or so, someone to come in and do a short presentation about it. And that helped the whole staff at that prison to really appreciate it a, a great deal more. And it opened up the relationship. Yeah, much that was out in Arizona. Um, yeah, yeah, of one of our visitors, Joe, uh, who um, was able to do that. Um, and he originally met this the warden, she was an associate warden at Tucson, and then she became warden at Safford, Arizona. And when she was there, she and he was visiting at both places, she asked him to come in at a staff retreat and talk to the staff and so on. And he said that really changed the whole atmosphere of the visiting uh, by the staff hearing and and asking questions. And apparently there was only going to be a 10 minute question period, but it wound up going for 20 minutes because staff asked a lot of good questions. They were intrigued. So, yeah. What, what, one of the other pieces that I thought was really fascinating was um, a lot of people writing about, again, in terms of kind of the role, their role as going in as a visitor. Uh, often they saw it as to come in and to, to active listening, compassionate listening, non non judgmental. Um, there's a lot of reference to to the tension that some of the uh, people would hold in terms of uh, really, you know, no matter, never to ask. Uh, it was clearly a mandate. You never ask what um, a person is incarcerated for. Some often they might divulge that in their own conversations with you, but that's never to be asked. Um, Most of them do, but not not all, but a good right. number. Yeah. And it seemed like, you know, increasingly, but the, for, for many people, the experience, you know, becomes an exchange that they, they see themselves as just going in to listen and let the person talk to when they haven't had an opportunity to talk to anyone. But many of the prisoners 
are looking to hear, <laughs> just t talk to me. Um, like, tell me, about, you hear these kind of really interesting anecdotes about like, tell me about the last thing, the last meal that you had, or like, you know, tell me what you did for the past month. I just want you to talk to me and like, let me hear information. And it, I think it was, it's very interesting in terms of the context of also relating it to a lot of the references about, again, maybe in my mind, sort of the dehumanization of the carceral experience where like in one of the Colorado prisons, which the writer says, is surrounded by some of the most gorgeous mountains that you'll ever see. Yeah, but within Florida, those walls, That's okay. you can't even, you can't see them, except if you're outside the prison. Inside the prison, you can't see the beauty of the, and, and so for a number of the prisoners, they don't see anything except for concrete, um, uh, like the, that and like the, 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 those who've been transported on airplanes and being on airplanes where the wall, the windows are blacked out so they can't see anything of the world around them. So there's that interplay with, please share with me about the world outside because I, I'm uh, yeah. not And one of the people here is uh, used to visit at that, uh, at the Supermax at uh, ADX. Uh, and um, she did an amazing job. Um, and um, yeah, you know, I, when, I, when I was visiting with folks and, you know, doing my national visits and so on, you know, I would, I would start to, to to a, a normal conversation of sharing where I've been and all that stuff, including sometimes cultural things and all that. And then I'd stop almost in mid sentence and say, do you want to hear this? You know, it almost sounds like I'm either bragging or, or, you know, or something like that. And in most cases, no, no, no. I want to hear what you're doing. I can't do these things, but I want to hear what you, what you've done. Uh, and I really needed to hear that, that it was okay to be sharing about yourself in some in, in good things, because they, they for the most part weren't having those experiences. Um, so it, it took a while to for me to feel uh, to be able to do that and not feel bad about sharing good things that were happening to me on the outside. Uh, but most of them, most prisoners seem to appreciate that. Yeah, let me ask one more question right now and then to see if any folks here want to um, raise a question or, or again a comment with with all the shared expertise that is in the circle right now and so what i'll invite people to do um, in order if you'd like to to share a comment or question um, to to use one of a couple functions to do that um, there is if you if you click on the reaction button in the bottom tabs uh, that are there, there's a raise hand um, button that you can click on. And if you raise your hand, I'll know to invite you in in just a moment, or you can um, put your name or question directly into the chat and I can read it for you if you'd like or comment. Um, but we want to invite your voices as well. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the one thing I'm that gonna, I'll- well, I, I'm going to just read one or two Brief quotes, if that's okay, if we have oh, time. Oh, absolutely, Eric. Let, let me ask my question, and then you uh, oh, oh, please, answer it, please. and then and bring a, yes. bring in a couple of those quotes that you. I know you've you've drawn out <laughs> some of the uh, many many voices. So let's do that. Um, so uh, as I read through uh, the book, and I again, I've as you know, Eric, I've finished almost all of it, not the entire. <laughs> um, uh, the um, I, I did not see in what I was reading references to the military prisons, which you name are a part of PBS's work. It's both federal prisons that you've spoken to yeah. and also the military prisons. Yeah. So I wonder if uh, it, it might be there and I just haven't gotten to that yet, but um, could you speak to, uh, are there any differences with engaging with the military prison system and what are some of the experiences that you would uh, cite from that uh, work? Well, the system itself, uh, it wasn't that different. There's a little bit difference. I mean, actually, it's really ironic. You know, you think of the military as being uh, totally unified and strict and all that. Um, and but when you compare it to the Federal Bureau of Prisons, for example, it's a lot looser. It's it's not really uh, the, the Federal Bureau of Prisons is run top down, you know, the Washington, you know, and uh they lay down the rules and all that. In the military, uh, in, in the practical terms, 
it it it's not at least it, I can only speak past tense. It, it was not really top down when it came to the their prisons. Now other things might be where so that each of the commanders or uh, wardens in the military really had much more uh, freedom to be doing things than in the Federal Bureau of Prisons, uh, which was much more run like a military <laughs> system than, than the military system's prisons. At least that was my experience. Um, and and, and I'll, just as one thought, um, if I had a concern, uh, you know, in the federal system, uh, I knew who to contact and I would contact the warden directly and he or she would respond. In the military, I really, I mean, I could do that, but it wasn't, it wasn't as a strong a thing. Uh, and if I contacted like Washington about something for the uh, Federal Bureau of Prisons, the, the head of the, the director of the bureau, things would happen. But with the military, they were very reticent to go and really tell their their wardens or com commanders uh, what to do uh, and all that stuff. It's just a very interesting little difference between the the prison systems of, of, of those two systems. Um, <laughs> uh, Thank so. you. Yeah. Well, why don't you offer us a a uh, couple of the quotes that you want to lift up, and then we've got at least one question in the chat and a couple other things. Okay. Um, all right. Um, this one uh, is from Alderson, West Virginia. I visited somebody who sobbed, absolutely cried and cried and cried for two hours. And then it was time for me to leave. And all I could say to her was to hang on. She had two children and nobody was taking care of them. Uh, and it just goes on and on. But, you know, to, to have a visit where you're, you know, the prisoner is sobbing for two hours, you know, I experienced that myself uh, on that. It's just, uh, to me, extraordinary. Um, and then um, this was from uh, Allenwood Medium in Pennsylvania. I was sitting from I was sitting across from a prisoner and I said something. I don't remember now what I said. And he started to cry. I thought I said something wrong. And I said, have I offended you in some way? He composed himself and said, no, uh, you didn't offend me at all. I've been in here for seven years and you're the first person from the outside that I've seen. So, you know, and, and then uh, and, and then. Um, <laughs> the visitor says, and I was hooked in visiting because that was like his first visit <laughs> to this with uh, there. Uh, you know, it's just like, wow, you know, just 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 amazing to to be able to to There's deep emotion. I mean, it, it, that what that evokes for me. Yeah, you you do hear many times about people's the, these incredible emotional moments. Like I think one that struck me, um, Eric, was. Um, uh, one of the visitors talking about the person that they were uh, uh, visiting. And I believe that person had children, uh, I think. And and because they were in the waiting room, seeing children in the yeah. waiting room just brought them to tears because, again, they don't hadn't seen children for so, so long. And and uh, just that that evocation of kind of their humanity. Um, very powerful. And here's another one. This is from Coleman, Florida. Um, uh, I also enjoyed the visits at the men's penitentiaries. Um, I'm firmly convinced that one prisoner I saw was on the verge of taking his life. I'll never forget being with him that day. He was very despondent and was taking everything I had uh, to use wise counsel to him to help him to think about life and living. I remember going back the next month to see him and he was like a changed person. He said, I wasn't really going to take my life, but I was really down and you came in that day. Uh, that one visit helped me get through the day. And when I got through that day, I could get through the next day. 
Uh, I want to just take one or two more. It's, there's so many. That's the problem with me. <laughs> um, but let me just get. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, this this was from long. Well, it was this was was one of visitors who visited Los Angeles, but on the group visits. Uh, once a year, the uh, PBS would have a national visitor conference and it would be in a different place. And it would be generally somewhere where there was a federal or military prison and there would be a group visit during the four day conference. And so this one was in Colorado, it was the conference uh, in Florence. And this was what this visitor said. And then there's a PBS mi miracle story. At the PBS visitor, I'm going to put my glasses on here. <laughs> um, uh, we had a group visit at Florence. All the PBS visitors were herded into this very large visiting room. The prisoners would come out the door in ones and twos, and the PBS visitors would go after them. And I thought, Jeannie, if you're going to get somebody to visit you, you better not just sit in the chair. You better go up and get one. <laughs> so the next time I saw somebody come through the door, I walked up and said, hi, I'm Jeannie Graves, and I'm a PBS visitor, would you like a visit? And he said, Jeannie Graves. And I'm thinking, my goodness, has my name gotten around the prison system? He says, yes, Jeannie Graves. He said, you visited me in Los Angeles. I always thought I would see you again because I remember one time leaving a visit with you and thinking to myself, she treats me like a person. So why am I acting like an animal? So I started to help other prisoners learn to read and write their legal papers, and I learned to crochet and make toys for children. The visit from you really changed my life. So you just, you know, and this is just over and over again, you know, you have instances like this that you have no idea what the impact can be on something like that. Indeed, indeed. Um, well, you bring up some powerful evocations for me that I'm going to speak to. And then I, I, again, I do want to bring in these um, sure. questions we're getting from the chat. So two or three things that um, come up for me uh, from what you were just sharing. First, uh, I'm thinking of another one of the um, essays, which spoke to one of the prisoners who said specifically to their visitor that like, after you visit for, they, they said, can you please come every two weeks instead yeah. of one to yeah. one? Because for two weeks, I'm good after you visit, and then it yep. falls apart. And and then one of the, the corrections officers yep. uh, affirmed that to the yep. visitor and said, that's, that's right. right. They're always good for about two weeks, and then they, they kind of fall apart. Um, and so it's just like the, the, the strength and the sustenance that's there. So that was one really powerful thing. A second, what you were just saying in terms of that beautiful story of that that person who had been in Los Angeles and did, was doing crocheting or, yeah. uh, and and toy making. Helping other I, prisoners. I saw again and again references to the arts and how many uh, of these um, prisoners uh, had just amazing artistic skills. And, and that was, I think, contrasted with maybe one of the, the stories where where one of the visitors spoke to in their experience um, that uh, they felt that a lot of the people that they were visiting definitely were living with different mental health issues, ADHD, ADD, and so forth. And if those had just been, they were that they were creative spirits, but they, that their the way they were living wasn't supported by the outside society in their earlier years. Um, and I thought that was a really fascinating because there, like there's references to painters and poets and novelists and and people who were doing um, pottery and tattooing, all kinds of artistic skills, which I really thought was fascinating. Yeah. Is it, you know, when you talk about that, for example, all this in West Virginia, which is was the which was and is was the first women's federal prison in the United States. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt played a part in creating in creating uh, the circumstances for that. Um, and one of the visitors, she's passed away many years ago. She was the resident potter at the Greenbrier. And I don't know if any of you know about the Greenbrier, but that used to be the yeah, um, great hotel in West Virginia 
presidents, Congress people used to go there for vacations and so on. She was the resident potter. And there was a prisoner who was doing pottery. And it just was by accident that she was assigned to visit with this person. And she was able to go and talk with her and all about pottery, you know, with this prisoner who was interested. And here was a professional potter. In fact, we have one of her pots that's sitting on our mantelpiece. Interesting. All right, let me let's read in uh, one of the questions we have here now. Um, we've got um, a, a question from uh, Felice and Jack, um, uh, uh, who um, ask, um, let's see here, is there any hope that the increasing use of restrictions of permitted correspondence, for instance, no colored ink, no drawings, etc., and mail copying services that remove the physical letters mm. form the prisoner's property will be slowed down. So uh, is there hope that that those restrictions that have happened will be, uh, will be lessened, I think? Uh, I guess I would be realistic that I, I, I would be very surprised, I think, of that. Now, I want to share one thing that, so you never know, because, you know, the general rule uh, has been that if you're a volunteer, um, you're not allowed to correspond with prisoners uh, as a volunteer. Uh, if you're not a volunteer, that's a whole different thing. And you're on the visiting list. But as volunteers, and it was very strict within the, the Federal Bureau of Prisons, although PVS was allowed to send a postcard to each prisoner to say when they were coming which was already an exception. No other volunteers were allowed to do it. But during COVID, <laughs> because there was no visiting going on, and again, I was no longer with PVS, but somehow or other the, uh, the, the, the folks, the, the leadership of PVS was able to negotiate with the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and they started allowing the volunteers to correspond with the prisoners. This was unheard of, you know, uh, because this is what you, you would, if that were happening normally, you'd be banned from visiting. That'd be it. It's over. And, and the prisoners could write to the visitors and visitors to the prisoners. Now, any of the correspondence did not go to the home. It would go to the PVS office who would then forward it. Um, it's going to be interesting to see once visiting really gets going, whether they're going to continue that. I would be very surprised if they'll continue that because uh, they're very concerned about contraband and, and that's the, the way it gets in there. Um, so um, I, I think that, you know, the prison system is just very paranoid, unfortunately, for good reasons, uh, that people will take advantage of good policies uh, so that if you're able to enclose things and so on or whatever, you know, it just takes one person to mess it up for everybody. And then they'll say, no, we can't do it. And all that. So I don't know if that completely answers Jack and Felicia's question uh, or not. Uh, and if it doesn't, please, you know, say, say more about that. But I want to just say that Jack and Felicia are people who I have admired for years and all their wonderful work. Bravo to you for what you have done uh, with the nuclear resistor and all these other stuff, you know, just fantastic. Indeed, I, I echo that. And, uh, and, a, and a nice uh, follow-up in the chat from Jack and Felice to that point. Um, and I think, I mean, it's fascinating because again, in some of the stories that are in here of people who were longtime visitors, and again, you had people here 15, 20, 25, 30 years of visiting and so forth. Um, you hear there, there's some people who remember when they would just walk into the, you know, kind of the general population area or come in with their purse and that kind of thing. They, they, they spoke back to that period, but- um, Well, come, uh, come in, listen, come in, come in with their child. Yeah, right. Exactly. Well, yeah. That, that's totally, you know, there's no way that's going to sure. ever happen. Again, yeah. But, you know, and, and all that. There, listen, I want to just since you talked about the purse, I'm, I won't read this, but I have it from memory. There was one of our visitors uh, visiting in Pekin, Illinois, and the uh, I'm paraphrasing this, but the, the, this was a female prisoner 
And she started to, to uh, it, during the visit, to put her hand down towards the floor by the chair. Uh, and the visitor saying, oh, what are you doing? She says, oh, I'm sorry. I felt like this was so normal outside things that I was reaching for my purse, which of course wasn't there, but she thought she was on the outside, you know, that, and when you hear stuff like that, it's like, oh my God, you know, that was just so touching to me to, to hear that, that this person felt so comfortable that I, you know, that, and, and was able to, you know, to think that she was really on the outside because of this wonderful visitor. Yeah, definitely. Well, let's, um, uh, we've got more voices here. So I'm going to welcome Olivia. Um, to <laughs> My sister. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you both and everyone who's done the visiting. I am speaking to the particular qualities that Eric, I know that you have and that every visitor has that I do not have, but that I just, I recognize and honor. And I remember going to Pleasanton with you quite a few decades ago. Yep. And I remember seeing the nun who had destroyed draft files and the young woman who was part of the Puerto, Puerto Rican Liberation uh, Army or whatever it's called, Puerto Rican Liberation Organization. And that, that visit reminded me of the very short stint that I had teaching dance in a like psychiatric ward um, where I had some miraculous moments, but I myself would leave and be a wreck. And that, that I had way too much empathy and way too much of a sense of um, yeah. the intolerable nature of locking anyone up. So I really want to speak to that combination of visitors who, and you who have uh, kindness and who have caring, but who also have enough protection that you can go in and come out and not be devastated. So when we acknowledge that and to thank all of you who have that a little bit, you know, different discernment, because for some of us, it's not possible to do because it is so in that level of cruelty is so intolerable. So I want to thank you and speak to that. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, and I'll just add to that. Thank you, Olivia. That I one of the things that I felt important about was not just to be supportive of prisoners, but to be supportive of the visitors. And so I read every report. I responded unless there was absolutely no need to respond to the report. And I think that's so important because the the visitors, are, you know, can go through such difficulties you know, that you would become, you could become a wreck. And that I hope that my little responses, whether it was uh, writing to people later, emailing, or even calling up people to just say, hey, you want to talk about this or whatever, to dress to, for, so that every volunteer visitor, I hope, knew that I cared about them and that I supported them and that I was there for them no matter what. And I think that's really something that, PVS really uh, does very well uh, yeah, to, and he, to be at, because you, you're not going to get very far with volunteers if you can't give them support. They need that support, especially in prison visiting. It's one thing if you're going to be supportive and you're going to go out somewhere in the community and all that. But to go inside and deal with all the things that you're dealing with, you need support. Yes, and sir. I hope that I was there 100 percent for all the volunteers. Absolutely. The witnesses need a witness. And, and I think the, I want to pick up a question that was put into the chat by Larry Coleman that I think really relates to what you were just talking about. I mean, Larry, um, you're talking about both the intentionality of your of your work, Eric, as constant communication with everyone, really. I mean, like you're with the visitors, with the, the system uh, and so forth. Um, and, and Larry says, do you have a mechanism to evaluate the visitors and what the persons being visited take away from the visits? Um, have you had contact with persons incarcerated who had visitors and gotten feedback on their visits after they're out? So could you maybe even describe a little bit more about just the process, both of maybe the training that people had for going into this process and uh, and uh, maybe even the recruitment. I mean, I think we haven't talked about that yet because I, I read time and again, people saying like, 
and I didn't know that I could do this or it was how it came to be. And like when people ask me, how can you do this? Well, it's actually just really easy once I learned how to do it. I'm just going in and listening. And but but that process of consider making sure that it's always being um, supported and strengthened and, and monitored in a way. Yeah. Well, I, I, as 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 far as any tools and all that, I think that um, there are other people in PBS who were better at developing uh, specific tools about evaluating. For me, it was the constant interaction with people um, that I, that's how I hope to be able to achieve some sort of way of evaluating by, you know, the, re the, the general requirement was that each visitor after his or her visit was supposed to send a report. Uh, many of the visitors do that, but I can't say that 100% of them did that. Uh, had one visitor <laughs> visited in, in upstate New York who he would call me. That was his, he, he just did not want to write things. He still, to this day, doesn't use email. <laughs> uh, and I think he's still visiting, actually. Uh, anyway, but he would call me. Okay, that's fine. I don't, I don't mind that. But there, I mean, there are tools. And I know that these days, the, the PBS has the online support uh, where people send in their reports through uh, the website and so on and all. Um, and that's, that's how that's seen. Whereas with me in my time, it was really still the old, the old time there, you know, sending reports uh, in the mail and then later email uh, on that. Uh, and that's what I relied upon. Uh, that was my strength. My strength wasn't in, in doing this other stuff, which is also important uh, to do. Um, but the main thing was to just be in touch with all the visitors. And so um, there would be some times when I would just decide and I'd pick up the phone and say, all right, I'm calling up 10 visitors today to just see how they're doing. Uh, and later on, it may be emailing, you know, uh, and, and all that to try and keep in touch. Uh, that's, that's what I did. That's still really old school. And today I know PVS does some more what I call modern stuff, technology type of stuff to try and achieve that. Great. Um, Chris Avery, um, love to welcome your voice. <laughs> I know who Chris Avery is. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I was going to uplift my sister who actually just left the call, it looked like. Her name was Joni Long, yes. and she was a visitor for, what, 31 years, I think, and yep. still pays attention to all of that. And um I just wanted to, and, and my other sister lived down the street from you in Philadelphia for many years. Yep. And it came to mind when you were talking about the 122 federal prisons plus, and then I'm even more impressed that you were calling them up as needed. So that's quite a few people in addition to keep in touch with. Yep. I wanted you to know that uh, although I never was a visitor, whenever we would have any kind of family gathering, somehow we'd hear stories from Joni about, you know, and it was always the mantra, call Eric. <laughs> and, you know, it's almost like a knee jerk thing. Like if you're in trouble, it's like, just call Eric, never mind whether it's about PVS. I don't know. You must've gotten stray calls from all kinds of people. So then I'm thinking now I'm hearing you're calling all these wardens and you're calling all the people. And so what comes to mind is, is, is there any, uh, whether it's solving a crisis or a joy moment, a phone call to anybody from or to anybody that comes to mind with all that phone calling. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll do, I'll give you two things though. One is on the phone calls because they knew uh, that I was available 24 seven, you know, if, if there was a problem, you know, uh, and I can tell you two calls that I got that I will always remember because I was at Whole Foods one Saturday shopping and I get this phone call uh, and uh, from a visitor saying, they're not letting me in. You know, I said, all right, give me the phone number, you know, and I called up the duty officer and, and all that and they got in. Uh, you know, I said, I have to, 
let me go over to the vitamin section where it's quieter <laughs> so I could speak and all that. And I, and I um, was able to get the person in. I was also with my wife and daughter at the uh, King of Prussia mall on a Sunday. And I get this call. They're not letting me in. And I, here I am in the small, you know, and there's, there's all this noise and all that stuff. And I, got over somewhere to hear and try and then and then called up the prison over that. That's as far as that kind of calls. I guess one of the most dramatic calls that I made, and I had to make a call twice actually, was uh, in Tucson uh, where um, uh, what the visitor was reporting that this prisoner uh, had cancer. They were supposed to do tests on him and so on, and and maybe they did the test, but they had they were it was months, and there was no test results coming back, or anything like that. And um, so I knew the warden very well there, and he was a very good warden, um, very supportive of PVS. And I called him up, and I shared that with him, and he said I'll take care of it. And then the next visit. And report still nothing. So I called him a second time and I just said, look, you know, we're still not getting anything. And then they finally did something and they got tests and they found out about the cancer and they began to treat him. And uh, I got this report back from the visitor and, you know, and the two of us said to each other, we saved his life, you know, that was by my being able to call and having, you know, the confidence of with the wardens, uh, you know, that it was not a call to criticize staff. Who cares about that? You were calling it because the prisoner needed help. Uh, and that came through. Uh, and um, I always think of that uh, and that phone call and that prisoner that we saved his life. If we hadn't called, I don't think he would have survived. Uh, and it wasn't uh, because anybody was out to get him. It's just bureaucracy or whatever, whatever the reason. It just wasn't happening. And somebody needed to be, you know, you know, told in a non-threatening way, please look into this. That story definitely came through in, in the book. And, and but it was a, an example of, uh, I think, a number of people who did reference, again, as we spoke about earlier, the the inhumanity many times of the prison system and um you know uh and sometimes really specific efforts to deny um the needs and the rights that are a number of references to health care and and that story you speak to is really powerful and and while as we noted earlier the roles of the visitors are, are not to be legal advisors or any that kind of stuff right. there are a number of points where um, that in your role, you're able to be an advocate at points uh, for folks who are really dealing with particularly healthcare uh, situations. Yeah. Which was healthcare crazy. Was, is a big yeah. thing, very big thing. Let's invite um, my colleague Susan Smith um, to uh, the conversation. Hi, Susan. Hi, um, I have a, a three part historical question. <laughs> uh, first, is uh, I understand that um, uh, PVS, uh, the program originated in 1968 and it was primarily uh, to visit conscientious objectors. So my question is, how did it evolve to other uh, incarcerated populations? And the second question I have is um, that in 1975, the Alternatives to Violence program was founded uh, also by the Quakers. And um, if it was an outgrowth of the PBS program, uh, and then the third part is, is there any symbiosis between, you know, are, are, are P PBS visitors also AV peers or, you know, is there some kind of, uh, you know, connection? Okay, so... The first part was now uh, you're testing uh, you're testing uh, you know the uh, uh, the elderly people here to remember everything perfectly. <laughs> um, the first part I do think you spoke to a bit earlier, which was that question about how it how it moved from being focused on 
supporting conscious objectors who are incarcerated to a broader population. And, and again, it began, you know, as individuals with Bob Horton and Honey Knopp, you know, from World War II and then the civil rights movement. And then in 68, it formalized in 68. Before 68, they were visiting uh, as individuals, sometimes together, uh, but not as an organization. And in 68, they were formally recognized uh, by the Federal Bureau of Prisons and later by the by the Pentagon, but um, yeah. So, so what happened is that visiting the conscientious objectors, which was that's who the only people that they were seeing or asking for, though the conscientious objectors st began telling the visitors, uh, "Hey, there's a lot of other people locked up here who are doing way worse than we are. We get mail, you know. We're for the most part we're not in solitary." Uh, and um, and they are and all that stuff. Why don't you visit them? That's what really got the uh, PVS to change, to shift it. And then, of course, once the war was, quote, over, you know, then the, it went even further. But it was the it was the the conscious objectors who were in prison who encouraged the visitors to see other prisoners. Um, and that's in the introduction, including especially with uh, the the one uh, former prisoner who, uh, in the prologue who talks about that in the in the book. So and that's is, is there any relationship, as Susan asked, between PVS and AVP? Well, they're two no, separate institutions, right? They're but, separate. Uh, they're they're both wonderful things, but they're, but they're very different in that one is has an agenda and the other doesn't. Uh, and, you know, and that's the thing. PVS comes in with absolutely no agenda whatsoever for visiting. You know, with AVP, you definitely have an agenda. It's a great agenda, you know, and you have these weekend things, you know, where and it's a group kind of thing and all that to try and work with with prisoners to free up, <laughs> you know, their thinking and to think about violence versus nonviolence and so on. It's a wonderful program. There, there have been PVS visitors who, you know, either at one time were AVP people and switched to PVS or vice versa. Um, you couldn't do the same thing in the same prison. You could be a PVS visitor in one prison and an AVP person in another but you couldn't do it in both prisons. And that would be for anything you, as a volunteer, at least in the federal system. Uh, you can only be a volunteer in one program. You can't be in more than one program, uh, and, uh, but you can do it in a different prison. And so that's why it's really separate, uh, but really two really outstanding programs. And AVP is fabulous. I, I, uh, um, I know, people who used to staff it. I know people who are in it and all that stuff. And it's to be commended. We're, we're approaching the end of our time together, oh. but I, I want to ask, um, I think, two more separate, maybe connected questions here. And if anybody else has something that you want to, oh, AVP, just to be clear, um, is Alternatives to Violence Project, uh, um, yep. just in case we're using too many acronyms yep. for our audience. Um, and a great, um, great program. Um, so these are separate questions. There is a little bit of a relationship, um, but we'll see. Um, so one is, again, there are a number of references throughout the people's stories and all that to, again, as you've named, Eric, this is not a religious program in any way, but many people do have a spiritual past. There's, as you, as you said, a lot of because they Because of the spirit and their religious belief, that's why they're visiting. Yeah, certainly. Clearly, you know, many people who are Quakers and were uh, learned about it through their friends meeting or something like that and and s spoke to a, a leading um, some Roman Catholics uh, and others who spoke to um, I, I can't count the number of times the that Matthew 25 is cited yep. in the book, yep. like, you know, yep. uh, I was in prison and you visited me. It comes up over and over again. And, and many of those, not all, but uh, Roman Catholics, uh, some Episcopalians and some others. There are people who self-identify as Jews, as Buddhists, and, and all name, you know, part of their spiritual 
um, grounding as having led them to this. So we even, we even had one one Wiccan who was a visitor. <laughs> wonderful. So former, former visitor. So the that first question, citing that kind of those multi faith, multi spiritual context that is not the work of the or of of PVS, but is their people's personal paths, um, is really speaks to like, what is the process of outreach and recruitment? Because clearly, a lot of them said, somebody came and talked to my friends meeting. And, and so clearly, there's some of that. So if I if you would speak um, to, I, I know you've been gone now for I think, five years as the ED, oh, but wow. like what you understand to be the process of outreach. And then the second question, I want to say it first, and then let you respond to them separately, or if there's an overlap, then so be it. The second question is really different. Um, which is, again, like, it's if my impression, it's an overwhelmingly, uh, uh, the visitors are overwhelmingly white people. Um, and overwhelmingly, uh, not exclusively, uh, but overwhelmingly that the population they're serving is majority um, people of color, um, black and brown Latinx, and a, a number of references to visiting native indigenous people, particularly in uh, the Southwest and, and um, people uh, and just powerful connections in those ways. So I wonder if you would reflect on, um, uh, in some ways, uh, that tension, uh, again, not going in with an agenda. You spoke about like the, the, the concern on the part of prisoners as to whether there's an agenda, and maybe some of that relates to race, or if you would talk about race in the context in any way in terms of the story of PVS and the work that it's done in a, in a country that continues to struggle with the legacies of white supremacy. So, uh, so the first question was... So about that, the recruitment process, uh, yeah. like, because oh, I noted that like it had seem to happen in some ways through congregations and meetings and, and spiritual communities. Well, and, per, and, 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 and direct contact often, you know, we you have a recruiter who would travel. Uh, at one point, you know, uh, there was one recruiter, Howard Maxwell was the first recruiter. He was with the Presbyterian church. Uh, and then we had other people, who, you know, that was again, the old style you know, where you you didn't have all this multimedia stuff and all that you have today. Um, today, PVS, you know, and it started really while I was still there, but it's really gotten much better uh, where you're really doing it through networking, but it's online networking. Uh, and that's how, I mean, most of the people today are going to find PVS through the internet. That's the common way today. It wasn't that way in the past. Um, so that's the difference. And um, uh, so you really have to do marketing and you're competing with all these other groups that are doing volunteer, you know, uh, uh, in that regard. So, so today it's really, you know, um, that kind of networking. It's not the same thing. So, uh, so I would say that it's, there's probably not a lot going on with, it, through the religious community uh, as it used to be, at least as far as formally it, uh, in that regard. Um, and I think as the religious, many of the religious networks aren't as big as they used to be, you know, and, and, pro and less funded, you know, as well. So the use of the internet in general is what's being done. As far as the makeup of visitors, yeah, that's that's been that way, you know, all the time. Uh, it's a reflection of of our country, but there's so many things to kind of put together about about that whole thing. Um, I know that PVS. I can't speak for today. The PVS made a big effort trying to recruit. Uh, quote, minority folks. Uh, and um, uh, and at one point, we even had a person of color who was one of our recruiters. Um, and it's just, I guess I would just simply say that if this were any other endeavor, it would have a better chance of really getting uh, more representation. 
you know, uh, f- for other volunteer activities. But when you're talking about visiting in prison, you know, it's already make it's already a difficult field to recruit people in general. Uh, you know, and to be frank about it, you know, you have you, you at least my experience has been that if, when you go into to the some of the my, the communities. Um, the 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 people who would tend to want to be interested in it in visiting and so on are already overcommitted because there aren't it's just 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 that's the way it is that's at least how that we found it again I'm speaking past tense I can't speak for today uh, on that there are, and and so you'd ask somebody you'd find somebody in, in the in the black community Hispanic community go, oh yeah you know you you're perfect all these qualifications. Yeah, but you know what? I'm involved in 10 groups already and I can't do any more. And with with the added things that when you're talking about prison visiting, you're talking about, I mean, it's not like volunteering with any other type of entity uh, because you have all these things that you have to do. You have to deal with the system. You, you've got to deal with, you know, the whole thing about clothing and, and appearance and security and passing the and passing the NCIC check. You know, they run a they run an FBI check uh, on you and so on. And and um, so it's it's difficult if you take for recruiting young people. Unfortunately, a lot of young people, you know, are may have some kinds of, you know, already something with the law. It might be a very minor kind of thing, but when the Bureau of Prisons looks at it and goes, I don't think so. So it's very difficult. It doesn't mean that that just because it's difficult, you don't go and try and do it. But it is difficult. It's I personally think it's just hard enough to recruit anybody uh, these days. And in the past, not only would it be, you know, from mostly from the white community, but it also would be people who are up in years as well as senior citizens was definitely the bulk of the visitors as well. And just to get not only people of color, but to get young people was or it was also difficult to do. Uh, but, you know, that's the way society is, it seems to me, where you reach a certain point in life. I'm reflecting on my own life, you know, when you finally get to say, now, you know, I'm retired. Now I'm going to really do what I've been wanting to do all these years. And, 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 and some people then go, and that's what they do in the prison visiting. Uh, the, the, and I've, I've over and over again, people have said to me in recruiting and all that stuff, and for the book too, you know, I finally reached a point where now I can focus on what I really have been thinking about for decades of going and visiting prison. Um, so it's not a good answer. It, 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 but I, 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 in fact, I don't know if anybody here would want to say anything about this. It's very difficult. Um, recruiting is hard as it is. And then to find uh, people, you know, who are more representative of the prison community is, is, is even more difficult. Particularly, as you know, as is noted again in many of the stories, um, you, you see time and again the the comments about the fact that how many of the prisons have been located in distant rural communities, away from the uh, far, far, far away from the primary populations uh, 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 where people are being pulled from um, in, in this time of mass incarceration over the last. Uh, 30, 40 years in our country, you, yep. you hear that so, so often uh, reflected. And it's one of the powerful things I thought is how for some of the many visitors, how their dedication in terms of often going far away from where they actually live yep. to go to two hours to go to places that, you know, that are sometimes one, two, two and a half hours away from that. Which way. Way. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, the thing is that it's very interesting. The, in the federal prison system, um, the Federal Bureau of Prisons might say, we need another prison, right? But it's not up to them to decide where to put it. That's up to Congress. Congress makes a decision on where the prisons go, not the Federal Bureau of Prisons. And so there's a classic example. 
uh, of this prison in Berlin, New Hampshire, which is right at the border of New Hampshire and Canada. <laughs> you know, and nobody in the Federal Bureau of Prisons wanted it there. But the congregation, I forget the senator who, I don't think he's alive anymore, but he was a very prominent Republican senator. And they had clout and that's where it got put. <laughs> in Berlin, New Hampshire, and they couldn't even start construction on that prison until the spring. During the winter and all that, the ground was impossible. You could not construct it. So it was delayed, you know, in construction and stuff. And where are you going to find people of color in that community? Or another place, we, we had somebody who was on here who visited at Florence, Colorado, uh, and again, Florence, Colorado, you, you don't, you do not have a, a significant population of people of color in Florence, Colorado, you know, Denver might be, but Denver is like two hours away. Uh, um, and um, so we, we knew we, we were lucky to find any visitors for Florence in this little tiny town that Actually, when we first came there, they had only one traffic light in the town. There were more prisons. It was a, it was a complex of four prisons. Still is Florence. There are more people in that population of the prison than in the town. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, that, again, it sounds like it's making an excuse. And there's still, you still don't feel good about not trying to get more people of color, Hispanics, uh, Native Americans to visit. It's just very, very difficult. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thanks so much um, for, this has been really just a rich conversation about the work of PBS and about this book. People wanna buy it, we wanna help you sell it. Um, and I know it's being sold, you, you can access it through the various, uh, uh, big uh, websites uh, that rhyme with different words and all that kind of thing. <laughs> we always want to support independent booksellers uh, of all sorts. So yeah. do you have a preferred way that you encourage people uh, and, and suggest people um, purchase a copy? Well, um, uh, it's interesting because Amazon is the one that's given us the most difficulty in, in selling it, which I don't understand uh, because it's done. It's distributed by a mate, you know, an international publisher and distributor. But, but so I, I say bu either Barnes and Noble or any independent bookstore, and it, it has to be ordered because it's ordered to print. And, oh. and my experience with Barnes and Noble is that it arrives within a week. Um, okay. And 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 on that, and it's there was just an interesting article in the New York because Times. It's self it's self published, right, Eric? So it's yeah. not through. Yeah. So we you can't we can't say go to the such and Not such the website. Okay. Right, right. Yeah. Although some, I want to say, some visitors have told me that they've gotten their libraries to order the book, which I thought was really neat. That's great. So um, people can ask their libraries and presumably at least I know several states that's happened and they've ordered the book. Fantastic. I see Sally's hand. Did you want to ask a question or say something before we finish up? Sally? Well, thank you, um, Ethan. Um, we've spent a lot of time giving credit, rightly, to Eric and PBS and visitors. I want to say a word about the prisoners. Not everyone connects. Not everyone wants visits. It doesn't always work out. Uh, people in the prison where I was visiting, and I presume this is true generally, uh, they have to come down, they have to wait 45 minutes to an hour, they get strip searched on the way back. Mm -hmm. uh, it has to be, they are also making a considerable sacrifice to visit. And so it has to be worth it yep. to them Absolutely. to visit. And of course, the people you get are people like me, retired, old <laughs> white women who can afford it. Uh, so who can afford the time and uh so i don't think there's much i don't see any immediate uh cure for the uh ethnological problem uh but uh i just wanted to give the the prisoners proper credit 
Indeed. And Sally, terrific visitor, coordinator, you know, human being. <laughs> I've, I've had the privilege of staying in her house, you know, it's, and, and going on, on senior walks with her. <laughs> really Thank great. You. Yeah. Thank you, Sally, for really naming again that that power differential and again, the dehumanization that is just so, I mean, you, you mentioned the strip search on the way out. I mean, I, I read, I think many references to the, the strip search, I think for some oh, going in, in oh, you know, yeah. both, yep. both directions. And so yep. Yep. That, what it takes to go through that for often what is, you know, a one hour visit, uh, that's really powerful. Yeah, I see yeah. another um, friend who would like to uh, offer some words. Um, uh, well, state, please share your name and, and what you'd like to offer. Unmute. Your, your line is muted right now, so you're going to need to unmute. Yeah. That's Dave. <laughs> there you go. Okay. And hi, Eric. Hi, Dave. How are you, pal? Uh, Eric and I have been friends for a hundred years, and going on <laughs> oh, it seems like uh, that. But uh, a question I had was: uh, in the uh, uh, federal prisons, uh, are the prisoners uh, ever allowed a uh, weekend furlough or a visit outside of the prison? No. <laughs> no. Short no. answer. Very interesting no. because the reason I asked the question is uh, I used to visit lifers uh, in the state federal oh. prison system in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And uh, these were lifers. And um, they were allowed furloughs on weekends, some of them, uh, for good behavior. And they and also they became very, uh, uh, some of them got uh, became very involved in uh, personal relationships with uh, visitors. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was not, question it was well known uh but uh i was curious if uh you know any of that went on in the uh, federal prisons yeah the federal the federal bureau of prisons is really the strictest when it comes to volunteers it's well organized they encourage it but um much more restrictive uh, uh you you re and i'll be you rarely hear i mean it there are problems in all the prison systems, including the federal, but you rarely hear about problems with volunteers in the federal system compared to the states and the counties or city jails, because they're so much stricter uh, on, on uh, what volunteers can do. Uh, and that's just the nature of the game. And the only reason that PVS got involved with the federal military from the first place is that's where the conscientious objectors did their time. And that and that's the two systems. And, uh, you know, PBS was asked from time to time about visiting in the states or counties. And it's like, listen, we're not even at all the federal prisons. You know, we can't do that. But it's different. And, and generally things are a little bit looser, so to speak, in the states uh, than it would be in the in the federal yeah, just uh, one other uh, question I had. Uh, were there any topics of conversation that were taboo or censored? Nothing was ever censored, uh, but um, the vi visitors are told, well, f uh, first of all, there's the policy of nothing in, nothing out. You never hand the prisoner anything. You never take anything from the prisoner. That's a, a given on that, or you'll not be visiting anymore. But as far as topics, uh, one of the things that we would say to new visitors um, is um, if you're, uh, if, if the prisoner starts to talk about escape <laughs> or about um, uh, harming another prisoner or staff, you immediately shut down and say, I don't want to hear any more about that because if I hear any more, I'm going to have to report this. And, and you, you don't want to be seen as, you know, re, you know uh, a person that's snitching. You don't want to be considered a snitch, but you can't afford to, if you hear something, to um, be able to, uh, you know, get 
you just can't afford to do that. And I'll just tell you, there's an example that many years ago, before we actually had a policy uh, uh, that re related to um, uh, things like that, um, there was a, um, a, a visitor was visiting this prisoner who shared with the visitor that he was afraid for his life. But he said, I don't want you to tell anybody. And he didn't. And this prisoner was killed. And because of that, we had a policy that we don't normally share things, you know, but, but if you hear about life is in danger, immediately that has to be reported. Uh, and um, that's the only exception uh, to the rule of being trying as confidential as you can. Remember, especially in the federal system, everything can be recorded when you're in the visiting room. So nothing is completely private. <laughs> uh, that, that, that's something that you have to learn. And um, I learned that a very interesting way because uh, I, was, I was visiting at this one prison and, I, and this prisoner said, could you visit, he was from Philadelphia, could you visit my grandmother, see how she is or give her a call, I think. And I said, no, you know, I didn't say anything. And halfway through the visit, the chaplain comes into the visiting room and says, you're not going to go and contact his grandmother, are you? So obviously they were listening, <laughs> you know, to the conversation. So this is why it's hard to recruit people because you have to be totally, you know, <laughs> try, you have to be cognizant of so many things and deal with so many things as a visitor and still be a good visitor. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if I totally answered your question, Dave. Yeah, no, you did. Yeah. Okay. You have answered many, many questions, Eric. <laughs> we are very, very grateful. I know that there are more, um, and I really encourage folks to be in contact with you directly and sure. uh, to learn more again about this work if it's something that you're uh, interested in hearing more about. And to again, to please purchase the book. It's really a great collection of many, many stories reaching beyond prison walls, stories of volunteer visitors and the prisoners they see. Um, um, and self-published, so purchase it through your preferred means yeah. of uh, of getting books uh, and all that kind of thing, and support the, the the source that you want to support. But really, do um, support Eric and the work of PBS in this way. Um, and if you're supporting things, you can support the FOR too. <laughs> A very good very group that's been around for so long. Thank you, Eric. Well, uh, please do. We welcome all of you to continue to be connected to the work of FOR in whatever way you choose. Um, um, if you're not receiving information from us through the e-messages that we send out, we want to be in touch with you. Please sign up through our website, forusa.org, or just reach out to us. Uh, send a note to us at for at forusa.org to learn more or connect with us. Um, we're really grateful to share this space with you today and with Eric Corson, um, editor and author of Reaching Beyond Prison Walls. Thank you, Eric, for this time. I really Thank you. Thank, thank, you, so thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Great to see people. Bye bye. Bye, Sally. Thank you, Eric. This is Sandy. Sandy, wonderful. Oh, my God. What a visitor. Great visitor. <laughs>